Red Bull are unstoppable. Max Verstappen finished the Bahrain Grand Prix nearly 40 seconds clear of Fernando Alonso in third, and they were lapping consistently around half a second faster than the Ferraris. And that wasn't even their true pace. Both cars were told to slow down during the race, and for Max this meant going 0.7 seconds slower than he could have done. Essentially, the Bulls could have been looking at a pace advantage of over one second per lap. Now, of course, there will be people who don't like the fact that Red Bull are so dominant. Mainly Mercedes fans, who I didn't see complaining when their team won eight championships in a row. Red Bull has risen dramatically dramatically since 2016, and this insane run of form has proved that the team isn't just a one-hit wonder, and it can genuinely fight at the front across different regulations, regardless of how much they're allowed to spend on catering. Like it or not, the team is surely going to go down in history in the same way that McLaren and Ferrari have, and it's going to do so while not selling a few fast cars to the ultra-rich, but by selling energy drinks to the average person. Arguably, it's the most successful business model in F1, which is a case I've argued on this channel in the past. But Red Bull's recent success can be put down to just three people, and they're not who you might think. But to tell you who they are, we need to go back to 2014. After an uninspiring first year of the new regulations, McLaren entered the postseason test with a new engine in the back of the car. After being the most reliable team on the grid for the 2014 season with just two DNFs, this new engine had to be something special. But it wasn't. The elegantly named MP4-29H-1X1 was able to complete just six laps in two days, none of which resulted in a lap time being put on the board. The unreliable engine in the back of this car was an early version of Honda's first F1 engine since 2008. Honda had initially planned to enter the sport in 2016, but despite the engines already being given to them at zero cost, McLaren forced them to bring this forwards to a debut in 2015. The 2015 McLaren F1 car was dubbed the Size Zero F1 car, and a view from the top really highlights why it had such a name. McLaren had decided that the chassis had to be incredibly tightly packed to aid aerodynamics, and so Honda were forced into making the engine smaller than any other F1 engine at the time, and they did this by running it at higher temperatures. Later in the season, they were forced to admit that their MGUH could only last two races at a time, a third of the distance it should have been able to cover. The engine was incredibly unreliable, and even when it was running, it made over 100 horsepower less than the Mercedes. Alonso famously called it a GP2 engine in Honda's home race, and these struggles ultimately led to McLaren finishing the season in ninth, with 12 retirements and two did not starts from its 19 races. The following year, Honda's reliability was significantly improved, as was McLaren's overall performance. The team jumped to sixth in the constructors' standings with nearly triple the points of the previous year. Sadly, it was back to status quo for 2017, with just 30 points scored over the year and another constructors' position of ninth. From the first four races alone, mechanical problems contributed to three retirements and two did not starts. Reliability improved a touch over the season, but the car was still far from quick, and so McLaren decided to cut ties with Honda for the 2018 season. Honda were due to start supplying engines to Sauber for 2018, but even the team that was bottom of the standings at the time wanted nothing to do with them. With McLaren having banned Honda from working with another team during their partnership, this looked like the end for Honda and F1. But it wasn't. Toro Rosso's team boss, Franz Tost, saw along with the Red Bull management some potential in the Honda F1 setup that hadn't been picked up on by any other customer team. Therefore, Toro Rosso made the jump to Honda power for the 2018 season, dropping the Renault engines in return for releasing Carlos Sainz from his contract. Toro Rosso were reportedly much more lenient with Honda when they started working together. The team didn't force Honda to create a power unit with a certain set of dimensions, and instead encouraged them to be more demanding, with the willingness to make compromises. As a result, the performance of the engine improved greatly, in just their second race together, the team finished fourth in the Bahrain Grand Prix, instantly overshadowing the best result of fifth that came from the McLaren days. Reliability was still something of an issue, with several PU-related DNFs over the season, but ultimately, the biggest drawback for this season was the car, which was rarely able to challenge for points thanks to poor aerodynamics. An upgrade brought by Honda in Canada increased the pace of the car by half a second a lap, and the development speed shown was what ultimately convinced Red Bull to switch to Honda powertrains for 2019. And the rest, as they say, is history. So who are the three men who made Red Bull so successful, and what do they have to do with Honda? Well, the first of these is Masashi Yamamoto. Yamamoto was the managing director of Honda F1 and is now a consultant for Red Bull. He was essentially the team principal for Red Bull's engines, and just as Honor and Wolf are credited for their team's respective success, Yamamoto should be credited for Honda's. There isn't a huge amount of information online about Yamamoto, other than what I've just told you. He's been with Honda throughout their V6 Turbo Hybrid project and took a lot of the blame for the failures with McLaren. Yamamoto was the one who had to answer to Honda's board of directors and convince them to keep spending hundreds of millions of dollars a year despite no success. Without Yamamoto, 
Yamamoto pushing against the public's jokes, Honda may have left F1 back in 2017 in a cloud of shame, whereas they currently sit as arguably the best, most reliable engine manufacturer in the sport. Experiencing such a low and bouncing back from it demonstrates Yamamoto's incredible strength of character, and it's an attitude you rarely see in F1. I mean, look at how Toto Wolff has been speaking about his team after just one season off the top step. To go five years with basically no success and still have the motivation to want to create the best F1 engine is exactly the right attitude to have in this sport. Yes, there may be ups and downs, but if you're not prepared to endure the bad parts, then you don't deserve the good ones. Working under Yamamoto were the two other people who I believe have been critical for Red Bull's F1 success. The first of these is Toyoharo Tanabe, Honda's F1 technical director. As a technical director, Tanabe was the one who oversaw the creation and running of this engine. Tanabe joined Honda in 2018, just in time for the Toro Rosso collaboration. He'd been with Honda since 1984 and was chief engineer for Jensen Button with BAR Honda for five seasons, before becoming Honda's race test manager. After Honda's time in F1, Tanabe was redeployed to work on Honda's road car engine However, in 2018 he made the jump back to F1, with plenty of relevant experience plus lots of free reign thanks to Toro Rosso's leniency. Tanabe worked trackside, combating issues when they arose and giving the team a more focused attitude to development, shifting from trying to develop many things at once to just getting one thing absolutely perfect. Working alongside Tanabe was Yasuaki Asahi, who was the head of engine development. This was the man who actually designed the engine in the back of the Red Bull cars, and so he was the final piece in the puzzle. So what did these three people help to create? It sounds amazing, doesn't it? The Honda RA621H was exactly the engine that McLaren wanted back in 2015. It was considered to be smaller than size zero, and yet it was unbeatable in terms of reliability, and was at least equal to the power output of the Mercedes. It was supposed to be Honda's final act in Formula 1, and so all the company's efforts were poured into making this absolute monster. Looking back through Red Bull's record in the turbo hybrid era, it's clear to see that the majority of their wins before 2021 came from either twisty tracks or wet races, and these two scenarios are where the engine matters the least in Formula 1. Having the most downforce will win races in Monaco, but it won't necessarily win you races in anywhere else. And similarly, some of Red Bull's toughest races came on tracks where straight line performance is key. Baku saw just one podium for Red Bull before 2021, and you can't argue that Ricardo's win in 2017 wasn't in very fortunate circumstances. With Bottas and Raikkonen crashing on the first lap, Hamilton being forced to pit for a loose headrest and Vettel being penalised for dangerous driving. What did I do with dangerous driving? This then goes to show that the limiting factor for Red Bull was not the car, it was the engine in the centre of it. The Renault engine was always blowing up and it was rarely able to keep up on the straights. The Honda engine wasn't much better in terms of performance when Red Bull first got their hands on it, but it was a lot more reliable, and the pace at which it improved ultimately led Red Bull to win the final race in 2020, before things started to get spicy. So as I've mentioned, the Honda engine brought for 2021 was a radical improvement on the last one, and it had to be. With the manufacturer due to be leaving the sport in 2022, Red Bull didn't want to be left with a bad engine until 2026. While they weren't often the fastest through the speed traps in 2021, they were regularly the fastest through the corners, which tells us that they were running more downforce at the cost of maybe two kilometers per hour in a straight line. Even with one of the best aerodynamic packages amongst all the teams, Red Bull were previously forced to make compromises thanks to their engine. While Mercedes could could afford to bolt on more downforce and still be quick in a straight line. The Honda RA621H produced 1,014 horsepower when everything was turned up to the max, up from 943 horsepower in 2018 with Toro Rosso. Although a gain of 71 horsepower in three years may not sound like a lot, it's 50% more than the gain Mercedes managed to make in the same time frame. Now, something I think we need to touch on is the engine freeze. It definitely comes across as a little bit suspicious that Red Bull wanted the engines frozen when they had one of the best ones, and so a lot of people have piled into a conspiracy theory that Honda and Red Bull campaigned together so they could have the best engine locked in, but there are a few things that I think I need to debunk. Firstly, Honda genuinely did intend on leaving F1. The program was costing them over 100 million pounds a year, and before 2021, it was obviously not delivering. Honda's management made this decision in the pandemic to save money, and to turn back on the decision after 2021 would make it seem like the brand had been walking away from the sport in shame, which was obviously not a good way to market themselves. Essentially, Honda couldn't reverse the decision because it would make them look silly. 
so what they had to do was throw everything at the 2021 engine in an attempt to leave on a high. Secondly, what people forget is that the engine regulations were going to be frozen from 2023 anyway. F1 wanted the teams to start working on the new ones coming in for 2026 sooner rather than later, so as to avoid the embarrassing unreliability we had at the beginning of these current ones. Red Bull wanted these regulations moved forwards two years so they wouldn't be left behind, and this was something that all the teams agreed to. And at the time of the decision being made, Red Bull didn't know what the other teams had in store, and so asking them all to freeze development could also lock in a disadvantage. The engine's performances were already converging anyway, and we were starting to see the effects of diminishing returns on the grid, so the freeze was probably even beneficial for the other manufacturers. They didn't have to keep throwing more and more money at their engines just to stay in touch with the grid. Having a good engine is always important in F1. There have been very few instances in recent history where a team has won a race without an engine that's at least close to being the most powerful. Having a weak engine always results in compromises being made. Teams will have to take off downforce just to stay competitive on the straights, but by reducing the downforce it means they'll be slower through the corners. Therefore, the team will rarely be able to compete with the one that has a faster engine, unless it's in the wet or a track like Monaco, where the engine doesn't have as much of an effect on overall performance. Even a team with aerodynamics as good as Red Bull struggled with this problem throughout the turbo hybrid era. Their package was regarded as one of the best on the grid, but they always had to make compromises to avoid being overtaken in the race. That said, AlphaTauri have the same engine, yet they had a miserable season last year and have had a pretty bad start to this one as well. Having a good engine doesn't guarantee a good season. Williams proved that in 2020, and has proved it in 2019. Both of those teams had the best engine on the grid at the time and yet neither of them managed to fight with the midfield in any meaningful way. Essentially what I'm saying here is that you can't build a winning car without a great engine, but a great engine won't be successful without a great car around it. The three people who helped design the Honda engine aren't the only reasons that Red Bull is so successful at the moment, but without them it's very unlikely that Red Bull would be as successful as they are right now. It's easy to get caught up just crediting Horner, Newey and Verstappen for this dominance, and you'd be forgiven for doing so, because those three are easily the most successful combination in F1 at the moment. But I think it's important to recognise the unsung heroes of this story, the ones who you might not have heard of. I want to make a video on Adrian Newey sometime soon, as there's no way I'm going to ignore his role in this dominance. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss it. Formula 1 is one of the most competitive sports to enter, not just as a driver, but also as a member of the team. A great understanding of science and maths is crucial in this sport, and that's why I'm super excited to tell you about today's sponsor, Brilliant.org. Brilliant is the best way to learn maths, science and computing interactively. It has thousands of fun, interactive lessons available, and there are new ones being added every month. I've found Brilliant super helpful while studying maths and physics, because while all of its courses are structured to allow people of any ability to start learning, I'm able to skip ahead and get into the really detailed stuff I need to know for my A-levels. One thing I love about Brilliant is that it always links what you're learning to real-world concepts, which I find much easier to understand than just the equations. For instance, momentum is described with baseball, and the basics of friction and air resistance are taught with reference to Formula 1. While I don't believe that everyone needs to be able to do A-level physics, I do believe that everyone should do their best to know as much as they can about STEM. Formula 1 is just one of hundreds of industries that are almost entirely dependent on engineering, and I'm sure the number of engineers required will only grow with time. Setting yourself up with a great understanding of these really important subjects will serve you extremely well in the future, and doesn't it just feel good to be smarter? To try everything Brilliant has to offer for 30 days completely free, then just use my link, brilliant.org slash John Warren. The first 200 people to sign up will get 20% off their annual subscription as an extra bonus. On a more personal note, Brilliant is the best sponsor I've ever worked with, and so by supporting them, you're helping me build a long-term relationship with a brand I really believe in and love working with. 